Um, okay, great. Um, so thanks everyone for coming to today's session. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Tuchin Campbell Moore. So Tuchin received her PhD from the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy and is currently a lecturer at the University of Bristol. Tuchin pri works primarily in formal epistemology. She has done fantastic work on the credo version of the liar paradox and epistemic risks, just to name a few topics. And today she will talk about probability filters as models for belief. Katrin, the floor is yours. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so this is um, a project, like it's a relatively new thing for me. I mean, I haven't actually talked about it before, so we'll, we'll see how things, how things go. Um, firstly, I wanna kind of say the kind of background of a lot of these, these ideas and kind of initial work on this was with Jason Konek. So I want to kind of thank him for that. Um, and the hand, the copy of my slides is at this kind of tiny URL link and Snow's just posted that again. All right, so I'm talking about these kind of probability filters as a model of belief. Um, so what am I thinking about by a model of belief? Or maybe I should call it model of uncertainty, um, but I decided to go with the term model of belief. So I'm thinking of it as an alternative to models like we think of your belief as captured by a probability function, um, assigning real numbers to various propositions or sentences or whatever you like. So this is like maybe an orthodox model of belief, I'm thinking. Um, there's then some other models of belief out there in this, especially thinking in this imprecise probability kind of literature. So we might think of capturing your belief as a set of probabilities. So um, you don't have a particular thing, but you've got a range of probabilities or in general, a set of probabilities. Got other models around, especially in this imprecise probability literature, where we kind of capture your judgments or your beliefs by your opinions on which gambles are desirable. Um, and that's supposed to capture your model of belief. And I'm proposing this kind of, I think, I think new one, which I'm calling probability filters. And um, and this model is supposed to be relatively natural, quite easy to work with, and a very general, so it can capture all the other models as kind of special cases. Uh, so it's something to work with, and it seems quite nice to work with, and seems to do a lot of interesting work. Okay, so what is this model? Um, so firstly, what we should think about is properties or probabilistic properties. And that are what your belief state or your yeah, your epistemic state is captured by your judgments of particular probabilistic properties. So when we think, if you think, if I think that my train will probably be on time, we can think of that as a relationship, perhaps of endorsement towards a set of probabilities, the probabilities that evaluate the probabilities that think it's more than a half likely to be on time. Okay. Let me say that again. Here's some probabilistic property. The probability that the train will be on time is bigger than a half. And I have this kind of relationship to this probabilistic property, namely I endorse it, that's what I'm saying. And your belief state is captured by which probabilistic properties you endorse, which ones you don't endorse. And that's kind of the model of belief is you endorse this probabilistic property, you don't endorse this other one. So we can naturally capture like a good amount of talk about or probabilistic talk. So if you think the probability that the train will be on time is between 0.7 and 0.9, that's something you might say. I think the probability is between 0.7 and 0.9, or I think it's between 0.7 and 0.9 likely that the train will be on time. We would capture that by saying you endorse the set of probabilities which assign probability value between 0.7 and 0.9. If you think that um, whether Bob had cornflakes for breakfast has no bearing on whether the train will be on time, then 
this means you endorse a set of probabilities where um, knowing cornflakes or cornflakes is probably is being on time is probabilistically independent of um, Bob having had cornflakes. Um, ah, sorry, this was supposed to say. Um, you can also capture a judgment that I think it's more likely that the train will be on time than Bob had cornflakes. How, you just capture, you believe, or you endorse the set of probabilities where which assign higher probability to the train being on time than to Bob having had cornflakes. Um, and you can ca also capture judgments about gambles or random variables by looking at using probabilistic expectation. So I endorsing this um, probabilistic property, it, you describe that as saying, I think that this, I think I'm going to win 0 0.1%, 0 0.1 pence on this lottery ticket, or my expected winnings are 0 0.1 pence. And that's captured by um, an endorsement of the set of probabilities where, where the expected value of the lottery is 0 0.1 pence. OK, so those are various examples of um, of these probabilistic properties, and you're going to endorse them when you, I don't know, you say, yes, I think it is 0.9 or 0.8 or between 0 0.7, 0 0.9. Um, and the belief state is captured by your endorsement of these various probabilistic properties. Um, so that's kind of a brief, that's what the model is that I'm working with. Why am I proposing it? Well, I think it's natural, it's powerful, and it unifies these various models that are available in the imprecise probability kind of literature. Um, so let's, I'm now going to say a bit more about these probability filters, what they are, and what it takes for them to be coherent. And then um, I'll spend some time in this talk talking about its relationship to these other models of precise probabilities, sets of probabilities, and desirable gambles. And then if we have time, I'll talk about uh, relationships to um, choice and choice functions um, at the end, depending on how things are going. OK. So this probability filter model. Being a bit more careful now, so your belief state, I'm sort of modeling your belief state by a set of um, subsets of the set of all probabilities. So you have this state F, it's got some members. These members are sets of probabilities. For example, the set of probabilities which assign probability A is 0.2. That might be a member of F. So it's a collection of these sets of probabilities. And we'll talk about them by saying you endorse that set of probabilities. I endorse the probability of A being 0.2. Um, means this set of probabilities is a member of the collection of all my endorsed probability things. Um, just because I, I'm going to use this notation quite a lot, I think, oops, there's this shorthand I'm using, which is these kind of bars. And you read that as, well, here's a description of some fact about probabilities, probability of A is 0.2. And this is just the set of probabilities where probability of A is 0.2. Instead of listing them out or describing in them, them in this way, I just put them with these bars around. OK, so your belief state is given by endorsements of sets of probabilities. We collect up all the sets of probabilities you endorse into this thing, F. That is your belief state. I've added a side note here. I'd quite like to explicitly capture rejection into this model, but I'm only capturing endorsement. I'm only saying you endorse a set of probabilities with the idea that you reject it if you endorse its complement. Um, for rational people, there's no need to also include rejection, but maybe for the irrational, there could be a difference, and maybe our model could include that. But for ease, I don't do that. I only look at endorsement. Um, 
and um, something. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just looking at endorsement. Rejection is captured by endorsing a compliment. What does it mean for these things to be coherent? So is it any old collection of endorsements of probabilities that's okay? No, there are certain rationality constraints on these uh, endorsements. In particular, they should form a filter. So the mathematical structure of being filter. So what does that mean? Basically, that means two important things. Firstly, it's closed under superset. So if you endorse some Thing like the probability is identical to 0.2 and you have something which is a superset of it, the probability is between 0.1 and 0.8, then you've got to also endorse the weaker thing. So if you endorse something and some other property is a weaker property, um, then you also endorse the weaker property. That seems plausible if we're capturing something um, I'm using this term endorsement. It's going to be similar to something like belief. Uh, you believe this set of probabilities, but I'm trying to kind of use the term endorsement instead. Um, this seems right. If, you, if you're kind of, yes, the probability has this property and some other property is weaker, then yes, it also has that other property. Second thing is it's closed under finite intersections. So if you endorse P and you endorse Q, then you also endorse P and Q, or the intersection of these two properties. Um, if you, let's give an example, if you endorse, let's say the probability of A is, um, is between 0.2 and 0.5, and you also endorse the probability of A being in 0.3 to 0.7, then you will endorse the kind of intersection of these two properties, the probability of A being between uh, 0.3 and 0.5. So it's closed under uh, sort of, um, yeah, closed under finite intersection and supersets. Um, there are two further properties, but they're kind of just non, be, be non-trivial. So it better be non-empty, you better endorse some things. For example, you better endorse like the tautology, the set of all probabilities, and it's got to be proper, you don't endorse contradictions or the empty set. But the, the two important properties are these ones, that it's closed under supersets and closed under finite intersections. So, that's the model. Those are my. That's my notion of what it is to be coherent. It's endorsements of probabilities, uh, endorsements of probability properties, and they should be coherent, namely close under supersets and finite intersections. Now, I want to talk how that mo how this model of probability fil filters relates to other models. So, the initial model is just precise probabilities. You've got particular probability p star. What somebody who has that kind of precise probability model, the way they look in this framework says they endorse the singleton of that particular probability function, or they endorse that the probability is identical to that fixed thing. So you endorse this singleton and all supersets of it. Um, and what that means is a probabilistic property is in the set of endorsements, if and only if the particular probability that you think, hey, it's exactly that thing, it satisfies whatever property you're giving. So that's the precise the precise model. But these are clearly special cases of the framework. They endorse particular singletons. Um, a feature of the precise probability ones is that for every probabilistic property, you either endorse it or its negation. You're kind of confident about everything. You say, yes, I endorse it, or yes, I reject it. Um, but in this, um, but that's rejected when we look at these um, imprecise probabilities. So it might be that you're not 
you don't want it pinned down to the probability being 0.3, but you want to allow a range of probabilities. It's 0.2 or 0.3, or maybe it's in the range of 0.2 to 0.5. Um, so a model that can capture that kind of thing is this imprecise probabilities where we capture your attitudes by, by a set of probabilities, or sometimes it's called a creed or set. I'll stick with the term set of probabilities just to kind of be clear exactly what I mean. So in this model, you think of somebody's judgments or beliefs as captured just there's a set of probabilities, and that's what captures the person's opinions. How does that look in the probability filter framework? Well, you endorse this, the probabilistic property of being a member of that set of probabilities and all its supersets. So that means you have any probabilistic property is in our endorsements if it's a superset of the thing that's representing the um, beliefs. So this is now, it's not fully judgmental. There's some things it doesn't endorse nor reject. It says, meh, don't know, or something like that. Um, there's some properties that it, it doesn't commit either way on. So those two relatively standard models of belief are special cases of this framework. But this framework goes beyond that. It can do more than these two. And the kind of case in which it can do more of them is in that it can get this kind of non-Archimedean behavior. So here's something that can be represented in this framework. You might endorse that the probability of A is strictly bigger than 0.5, you think it's more than a half likely to happen, but you endorse that it's strictly less than 0.5 plus any particular value. So it's less than 0.5, 0. It's less than 0.501, and less than 0.5001, and less than 0.5000001. It's less than all of those, but it's still bigger than bigger than 0.5. Now this might capture a judgment. I can I can say it informally as something like, um, I think this coin is infinitesimally biased towards heads. It's it's more than a half likely to land heads, but no fixed amount um, more than a half likely to land heads. 0.6. No, it's not more than it's not. It's less than 0.6 likely to land heads. It's less than 0.55 likely to land heads. It's less than everything particular. It's not. Um, it's not, yeah, it's just infinitesimally biased towards heads, um, but nonetheless biased towards heads. Now, this sort of behavior can't be captured in the set of probabilities model. Indeed, if we look at the endorsements I'm making here and you intersect them all, you say, um, what probability functions satisfy everything I endorse? Answer, nothing at all. There's no probability functions that satisfy everything I'm endorsing here. Um, I'm, I'm restricting my probability functions just to be things, um, I didn't actually say it. Um, but basically, you could, if you wanted to find a probability function that satisfies all these probabilities, then it's got to assign a hyperreal value to the probability of A. I'm not assuming hyperreals around in the background. My initial framework is just probability functions assigning real numbers to propositions. No hyperreals, no non archimedean stuff. But we get non archimedean behavior by having judgments which are jointly, I mean, inconsistent. There's nothing that satisfies them all. But I'm still saying that's okay, that's coherent. So this is kind of why I don't, this might be a cheat, but I'm not using the word belief because I feel like. Um, it becomes a bit harder to to just to to um, explain what's going on here. Um, so this is an important feature of the model, but it is the one that makes everything a lot harder to interpret and discuss and say what's going on. Why is this OK? Um, so I'm saying this is OK. You allowed this kind of non archimedean behavior. It's infinitely inconsistent, but it's finitely, but it's coherent it satisfies the finite intersection property. So there's no finite contradictions here. 
any finite collections of probabilities you endorse, you they're they're consistent. What's what's the problem is you can't have thing have any probability function satisfying all the pro all the properties you're asking of it simultaneously. You can always find one satisfying any finite uh, properties. Okay. So we can. Um, so we've got special cases of our model when um, when we could rule out this behavior and require that, for example, that it's closed under infinite intersection, infinite consequences um, must all be contained. You could add that. That's okay. You would exactly get back in precise the set of probabilities model. Um, but I'm rejecting that restriction. I'm also kind of interested in this um, uh, non-Archimedean hyperreal kind of behavior. And we, it's kind of cool that we can get it out without first of all having to do, oh, extend the space of reals to include hyperreals and then do all this stuff. Um, so we have special case of the model when here's, here's some properties of filters. Principal filters are ones that are sort of generated by a set of probabilities. Um, that will give you either the probability model or the set of probability model, depending on whether you also include totality. Totality saying you're judgmental on everything. Everything's either endorsed or rejected. Uh, everything, either it's included in the set or it's negation, it's complement. So, with this assumption of totality, we get out an ultra filter. If it's a principal ultra filter, we have a probability function. If it's a non principal ultra filter, we have something that's, I mean, this isn't, a, I haven't got a formal thing I'm claiming here, but this is basically a hyper real probability thing, a hyper real probability function going on. Um, and if you reject totality, so there's some things which you neither endorse nor reject, then we get a set of probabilities model or some kind of hybrid of sets of hyperreals or yeah, um, some kind of hybrid of these two expressive frameworks, expressive powers. All right, so that's the kind of first section. Here's my, here's my model of belief. Probability filters are endorsing set, endorsing properties of probabilistic properties. Special cases are when we have these features of being total or being principal. Um, and then we can get out these models of probabilities or sets of probabilities as special cases. So it's expressively rich. It can do lots of stuff and it does it in a unifying way. And I think that's cool. Um, there's, so the next thing I want to talk about is this desirable gambles model of belief. So in this imprecise probability, um, these, um, under the, under the label of imprecise probabilities, there's a lot of different models out there. Um, now there's certain models like comparative judgments or um, um, lower provisions and upper provisions. Um, and those are um, those can be kind of um, so desirable gambles is proposed as a model that kind of unifies all of them. Like they're all special cases of this and the desirable gambles is what you need to get the full interesting expressive power out. Um, one thing that desirable gambles can't do, which also goes under the heading of imprecise probabilities, although potentially it's kind of different communities here, is just sets of probabilities, arbitrary non-convex sets of probabilities, which is kind of what I've already talked about here. Um, so we've got these sets of probabilities model, or we've got this desirable gambles model, and then lots of models coming underneath that. Um, and this framework I'm doing is unifying both of them. It can do the, the sets of probability stuff here, and it can do the desirable gambles of special cases. So the, um, the probability filters kind of 
is more expressive. It can capture all the desirable gambles framework. Um, and I think it does it in a way that's pretty familiar or it looks more like a model of belief than uh, a set of desirable gambles. That doesn't quite look like a model of belief. This feels like it is a model of belief. OK, so what's this model? So this captures your beliefs or your judgments. Probably these guys are going to be more happy saying is a model of uncertainty than the model of belief. But I'm interested in it as a model of belief. So that's what, why I'm kind of using that term. So you're capturing your belief by a set of gambles. Which gambles? Those that you evaluate as desirable. So desirable being preferable to the status quo. And this model is equivalent to um, strict comparative judgments on random variables. So you have this lottery ticket from one lottery and this lottery ticket from this other lottery. Which one's more, you know, which one do I think has a higher expected value? Judgments like that. But that's what's being captured in this model. So we can capture this model quite naturally by using these probability filters. So what the desirable gamble model was trying to capture is this notion of evaluating it as desirable, evaluating it as preferable to the status quo. So what that means in our framework is that you endorse the set of probabilities that thinks that that gamble is a good thing. So you have a gamble. Um, this is just a function from the possibilities to real numbers. Um, probably it has to be bounded. Um, and it's evaluated as desirable if you endorse the probabilities that expect it to be positive. Um, so you endorse it having positive expected value. You think it's more, you think it's uh, got higher expected value than the status quo, which gets value zero. Um, so you endorse the probabilities that evaluate it as preferable to the status quo. That's, you, we capture the judgment that a gamble is desirable by this set of probabilities being a member of our set being endorsed. Now, for everything I'm, I'm doing here and all my formal results, I'm restricting just to finite um, sample spaces. I just have finitely many possible, possible worlds. Um, so what I'm thinking about here is then expectation is just, you just sum up the probability of the world times by how, how, what the gamble gives you in that world. Or written another way, this is just the dot product of these two things. Um, okay. So my claim is that probability filter model is more general than the desirable gambles model. Um, I want to actually kind of go through this game a little bit. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so let's try and get a bit clearer about what's going on. I'm not sure how familiar people are with all this stuff. OK, so we have, if we're just interested in, for example, um, just two possibilities, a coin landing heads and coin landing tails, and we have a gamble which is going to give you, um, you're going to, we can represent them in, in this space by this gamble is, let's say, you're going to lose a pound if it lands heads, and you're going to win, I don't know, two pounds if tails. Or we forget the pounds and we just look at, kind of the outcome, the, the value, so minus one if heads and plus two if tails. Um, that's represented here. It's like minus one and plus two. Um, so they're vectors. We can represent them in this space. Now, our probability is going to be something like here, some point here. There's a line of here are all the gambles which it evaluates to have value zero, probability expectation of these is zero, everything over here, it thinks they're desirable, everything over here, it thinks they're bad, um, everything here are identical to the status quo. 
So individual probabilities split the space of gambles like this. They think all these are good, all these are bad. So for our model, we've got a gamble here. When is that evaluated as desirable? If the set of probabilities evaluate it as good, these are all the ones coming yeah, underneath it here, coming above it here, when the set of all those is a member of our set. Since all this stuff is closed under supersets, all you really have to do is look for a subset of it that's um, a member of our set. We have to endorse the probability of something in here, and then this gets to be desirable. If you look over at something down here, you've got to endorse like the other side. So the it being like the probability being bigger than 0.2 or whatever it is. Okay, so that's how the kind of two models are linking up, the probability filter models and these desirable gambles. What we can do is we can start with a probability filter and we can collect the gambles it evaluates as desirable into a set. So this probability filter thinks those, those gambles are desirable uh, using this kind of relationship. So a gamble is evaluated as desirable according to it, if and only if um, you endorse the set of probabilities which make it have positive expected utility. And then we can look, well, what properties does this set of desirable gambles have? What properties on desirable gambles come out of our probability filter model? Well, we get the properties that um, that something that's identical to the status quo is certainly not desirable. It doesn't have positive expected utility um, because no probability function thinks that it has positive expected utility. If a gamble is strictly positive everywhere, it assigns um, you get a, you get um, positive. Exp it like has a positive payoff, whatever happens then it's certainly evaluated as desirable because every probability function thinks that it has positive expected utility. And so you endorse the set of probabilities that think it has positive expected utility. If you've got two um, gambles which are both desirable, then a linear um, a weighted average of them is also desirable. Why is that? Because you endorse the set of probabilities making G desirable, and you endorse the set of probabilities making f desirable. If a probability function makes g desirable and f desirable, then it makes this um, weighted, um, weighted sum of them desirable. So I can, I've got it here. You endorse this set of things and you endorse this set of things. Any probability function that's here and here will make this desirable. And so by a finite intersection and subset thing, that's also desirable. Uh, final property that taking scalars. Um, so if you've got something that's desirable and you multiply it by 100, then it's still desirable uh, because probabilistic expectation doesn't care if you multiply it by something that's positive. So that's the, these are axioms you get out from starting with our probabilistic filter model. What does desirable gambles look like? answer here's some here's some properties and these are independently the notion of coherence that's given for desirable gamble model um, so if you in the imprecise probability literature and you look up what's coherence they're going to give you this well actually not quite because um, an axiom that's usually accepted in that um, an axiom that's usually accepted says if a gamble weakly dominate zero if it's weakly positive everywhere and strictly positive somewhere. For example, something lying on this line has zero value in world one, but 20 in world two. They impose an axiom that says that is desirable. Now that actually doesn't immediately fall out of my account unless you say um, you've got some kind of regularity assumption going on that you believe every possibility has positive probability. So if I think that it's just impossible, probability zero, that you're in world two, then this gamble which lies along one of these axes is going to have zero expect utility because you think 
got um, yeah. So to get to get the usual axioms, you need to impose a restriction on these probability filters that you think that the probability function is regular, that every every possibility has positive probability. Um, but I would rather see that as an objection to the framework, but if you want to see it as just, we add, need to add an, another axiom that you have to endorse every, pos pos every possible world being having positive probability, that's fine. I, I'm happy to endorse that as well. Okay. So what's interesting is not really the fact that these axioms are satisfied in our model. Because also, if you look at these um, set of probabilities model, then these axioms are satisfied as well. What's interesting is that they're exactly the right axioms, that every, um, that every set of desirable gambles that's coherent can be obtained from probability filters in this way. Whereas those obtained from sets of probabilities are special cases. And the example of the difference is this kind of non archimedean behavior, which is allowable in the probability filter model, but not in the sets of probability model. So this set of gambles here, which includes this axis and not, and this is an open side, this is not representable in the set of probability model. You can't fit any individual probability um, so usually they look something like this, and you're just trying to fit, fit probabilities sort of in between here. And you can't do this in this model because like you'll end up including, um, yeah, you'll end up including the one of the edges that you don't want to include. Um, but it is representable in our framework because, um, well, <laughs> because of this non archimedean behavior, so since you evaluate this as desirable, you think that the probability has to be strictly bigger than 0.5 for this to be strictly desirable. But also you evaluate each of these to be desirable. You evaluate the probability to be strictly less than 0.5 plus epsilon. So you capture this model by this collection of endorsements that is sort of infinite, is they're incompatible endorsements, but they're finitely coherent, and um, that's that can capture this model. Um, I don't know how much we want to kind of actually look at this. Um, let me briefly say some things. So this is just the statement of the result. If you've got a coherent set of desirable gambles, you can find a coherent probability filter, which exactly gets you those gambles as the ones that are desirable by, i.e. Um, a gamble is evaluated as desirable if and only if you endorse the set of probabilities which probabilistic expectation is positive. To do this like, construction, um, what you do is you try to construct the relevant set of probability, the relevant probabilistic endorsements. You put, well, certainly we've got to endorse that the probabilistic expectation of G is positive for your things which you want to be desirable. So we, we say, you've got to endorse that, you've got to endorse that, you've got to endorse that. To make this, this set coherent, you've then got to close it under our under our finite intersection and superset. That was the notion of coherence for probabilistic filters. It got to be a filter. You got to close it under these properties. So you chuck some things in and then you close it under finite um, intersection and um, superset. Um, and this will be sort of the minimally committed filter which does what you want it to do. There will, there will usually be more. You could go beyond that and still do what you want to do, but this is sort of the minimally committed one. You've only got the consequences that you need to have. And then what you need to do is just check that it hasn't, hasn't added anything you didn't want it to add. That 
anything that you did add in this process when closing it under those properties was something you already had at the beginning. You, um, you've added the Fs, which you endorse this, where this is the superset of the other things you endorse. You need to check that you, if you in, endorse each of these, namely these are all desirable, then F was already desirable. And basically, um, I guess a lot of results in this area are you use a separating hyperplane result. So you've got some finite, finitely many gambles. You endorse each of them. Um, if your gamble F was not in, if F doesn't weakly dominate some linear combination of these, if F isn't in this blue area, but is out here, you can start find some probability function which thinks all the Gs are good and F is not good. All the Gs are desirable and F is undesirable. So, um, so this the probabilities that make F desirable is not going to be a superset of the ones that make each of the others desirable. So we've only added Fs where they were a superset of that. That is, we only added Fs which are already in the blue area but by the axioms of coherence on desirable gambles, they're all, they'll already be desirable anyway. Okay, so that's the kind of result. Why talk through it? Well, A, it's interesting. B, this notion of kind of um, closing it under finite intersect, you kind of take the minimal consequences. That's something that's nice to see. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I want to talk through it a little bit. So what we've seen is unlike the sets of probabilities model, probability filters capture the full expressive power of the desirable gambles model. Um, but it goes beyond desirable gambles model. It's not just equivalent to it. Distinct probability filters can agree on which desirable, which gambles are desirable, but disagree as a model of belief. In fact, we already had that in the sets of probabilities model. Sets of probabilities can agree on which gambles are desirable, but disagree on the model or the belief state, because desirable gambles can only capture convex sets of probabilities. Um, so this probability filter model can do the both. It can do the desirable gamble stuff, and it can do the set the non-convex sets of probability stuff. Now, some people do take this to be an objection, like non-convex sets of probabilities um, shouldn't be counted as a model of belief because they have no meaningful difference or something like that. I guess I just want to say there's much more to be thought about here, but I, I'm sort of proposing that there is a difference. Um, I do think that they are interesting differences that could be captured. That kind of idea has um, there's been some recent work on trying to capture decision theoretic differences between non-convex sets of probability. And the thought is that when we were looking at desirable gambles, we were just focusing on whether this particular gamble is preferable to the status quo or is better than some other particular gamble. So we're only looking at two gambles at once. But choice is a more general notion. You get given a list of options. Um, you get given, um, you know, the option to pick this ticket or that ticket or this third ticket or this fourth ticket. Which one do you want to pick? So it's not just this or this, but it's like here's a list of options. Which one do you want to pick? And that that further notion of choice can capture more expressive power. Um, for example, all of the all of the con, all of the sets of probabilities model can be captured as differences in that. Even though they can't be captured in individual desirable gambles, it can be captured as difference um, in a choice function in which um, you get given a list of options. Which one do you want to pick? Um, well, these ones. That's a notion of behavior or choice, and it can it can distinguish these um, sets of probabilities. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about
this choice function stuff. So the thought is, you've got a fixed belief state, and I'm taking this to be um, this probabilistic filter. I'm not dealing with anything like I just fix a utility function. That's I'm just holding that fixed. If you wanted to um, have a model of pairs of probability and utility, you could do that in the framework. Just make sure it's a filter. Um, but I'm, I haven't thought about it. So you've got this belief state f. Um, got some list of options. Which ones are choice worthy? You've got to judge it. Why am I talking about this? Well, for one thing, it's been, it's kind of an important notion, and it's good to see how it links to this framework. It also just helps to see like how to work with these models, how to understand these um, endorsements and probability filters. And the third reason is it is being proposed as a model of belief or capturing kind of real differences between these um, these different models. And um, the probability filters model can also capture these differences. Uh, that was said a little bit wrong. Probability filters can capture the expressive power of choice functions is what I want to say. So we've got a list of options. Which ones are choice worthy? Well, probabilistic expectation. But that doesn't answer everything. It still depends on some kind of choice rule or choice procedure. So these have been thought about in the sets of probabilities framework. And there's two, for example, there's two kind of prominent options you might go with here. E admissibility says that an option is choice worthy if some member of your probability set evaluates it as optimal. That means um, it's got expected utility amongst the best. It doesn't necessarily have to be top. It doesn't have to be strictly better than everything else, but it's, it's one of the top things. Some probability function thinks that it's optimal. That's when an option is choice worthy. Whereas maximality says an option is choice worthy if there's no other particular option such that everybody in this choice set, everybody in the probability set thinks that that other thing is better than O. All right. One thing I'm going to have to do is these are stated for sets of probabilities. How do we translate them into our probability filter notion? Well, for maximality, it's pretty easy. You always choice worthy if there's no other option such that in the in the sets of probabilities model, such that every probability, so it says uh, every probability agrees that that other thing is better. That means those probability, the set, every probability in the set also thinks that O prime is better than O. And this we can just put in our framework as that you endorse O prime being strictly better than O. So O is choice worthy if there's no other option that you endorse be strictly better than it. OK, that's fine. That's easy enough. E admissibility, it's You've got to do more work to translate these notions into our framework. So o, E admissibility said O is choice worthy if some probability function evaluated O to be at least as good as everything else. But our framework wasn't able to talk about some probability function. You might attempt to translate it into our framework as saying something satisfying all the properties imposed of it has. Um, has a certain judge has a certain opinion, but that's not going to work because um, sometimes there are no probability functions that satisfies everything that is endorsed of it because they can um, because of this non archimedean behavior. So what you have to do to capture this kind of opinion is um, let's look at which options are not choice worthy. Well, the options that are not choice worthy in this sense are those where every probability function thinks that something else is strictly better. And that you can then, now we're talking about everything, that's just being sort of a subset, and that's just sort of, we can now translate that into our framework. So 
The way you translate the admissibility into the framework is O is not choice worthy if you endorse O being non optimal or it being a bad choice. So for e admissibility, you think O is a bad choice if you endorse it being a bad choice. If every probability function or yeah, if you endorse the set of probability functions that think it's a bad choice. Otherwise, it's choice worthy. So it's a bad choice if you endorse its badness, otherwise it's okay. But the difference between e admissibility and maximality is that all you have to the O to be a bad choice in e admissibility, you don't you don't have to have a particular reason for it being bad that you endorse. So every you've got to say, I, I'm certain it's bad. I know it's bad. That's that. Yeah, it's definitely bad. And someone might ask, why is it bad? And you say, oh, uh, because like you have different reasons for it being bad, but at least they all agree that it's bad. And e admissibility thinks that's enough to be bad. Whereas maximality says, to be ruled out or to be bad, you've got to have a particular reason. You've got to have some something else that you think you can point to and say that other thing is better. You've got to have a particular reason you endorse for its badness, whereas for, for um, e admissibility, you just have to be certain of its badness. Um, oh, I have some side thoughts about. Oh, about Russian. I'm so sorry to just. Can I quickly ask about this bit about the e admissibility? Um, what you just said, so this O prime that is that you use, that you invoked in the not choice worthy definition of e admissibility, is that this um, that would be the reason it seems. Yeah, that this was supposed to be just an informal gloss of you've got to be able to point to some. Sorry, for maximality, you have to be able no, to no, point I just, to something I'm, I'm, else. Right, I'm a little confused as to why it. The, the 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 not optimal being a bad choice it, as far as e admissibility goes seems to it seems very similar to maximality in my uh the way that I'm I'm seeing it. Yeah, the difference is the quantifiers. Let me actually write this out again. Um, well, I need to, I need a new page. Okay, so for e admissibility, you've got to endorse. I'm going to do it in my framework because I think it's kind of a useful way of seeing the difference. So for it to be bad in e admissibility, you've got to endorse um, that there is some particular some something else which is better than O. Okay, let me just write out what maximality says. Has to be there exists an O prime in O such that you endorse O prime being better than O. So the difference is, does there have to be a particular something else you can point to and say, I think that that other thing is better? Maximality says you've got to be able to pick out something and say that other thing is better than the option on the table. Whereas e admissibility says, if you have two different probability functions, um, um, let's see if I can come up with an example. I'm trying to draw something so from the side of Bell's paper. So there are three options that's called H, G, and F. Now, and these are sort of probabilities are down the bottom and how good well, basically, basically what I want to say is um, F is not better than G because down here it's worse. F is not better than H because down here it's worse. But every probability function thinks um, that there's something that's better than F. 
this probability function thinks that h is better than f, this probability function thinks that g is better than f, they both agree that something is better than f, they just don't agree which thing is better than f. And that's what's going on here. The irreducibility says they've got to agree that something else is better. They don't have to agree which thing is better. Um, is that how? So I thought the here the O's are the um, the the G and F and H as opposed to the probability. Um, yeah, O's are options. So you're going to choose between O1, O2, O3, and O4. Right, so um, you are choosing among G's and F and H. In that case, I think in that example, uh, all three are admissible in terms of maximality. Yeah, if I remember all correctly. Three all three are admissible in terms of maximality, but not in terms of e-admissibility. E-admissibility says f is ruled out. Um, I should have, so I'm using O and O prime. Well, it doesn't, I was using G's, F's and H's for like random variables where we've already got the utility plugged in there. I was using O's for the options before you plugged utility. Right. In, I, I think in the in the Seidenfeld example, regularly, yes, they you're right. I but I thought you you um flipped at the definition of e admissibility and started to talk about not choice worthy and then the phrasing is um different. Yeah I'm I'm saying so if you want to capture the e admissibility in this framework, um, it's better to think about which things are ruled out, which things are not acceptable. Like F is ruled out because, because you're certain that there's something else that's better than it. You just don't agree whether it's F. You don't know if it's F or G that's better, but you know that something is better. I'm reading your slide and it, it reads that e admissibility, it, you say that O is not choice worthy if for every P in the set big P evaluates some O prime to be preferable to O. Um, yeah. It's not clear to me how every P in the other picture evaluates themselves to be superior, either H or G to be superior to F. That does not happen for all. Uh, well, it's it is supposed to happen. So the probabilities here's like P one, here's P two, and here's P three. P one thinks that G has value whatever, F has value whatever, and H has value whatever. P one thinks that H up here is better than F here. Am I understanding it correctly that the O prime actually is something that changes with that P? So essentially for every P, there's some kind of O prime P that subscript, there's a, so so this, this target O prime can change according to which P you're talking about. Let's just ignore talk of O prime and just talk about them being gambles. They're just supposed to be gambles. Um, the only difference is the utility function. Um, hasn't been specified when you're given options, but these are just gambles. In a, you have to pick some some gamble from a set of gambles. So yeah, I could just replace all my O's by G's um, and call them gambles. Um, so we've got G and G prime. Um, that's what they're supposed to be. So they've got to differ with the world. And then, like you do, probability expectation will di will change their change, like this probability. Yeah, how valuable this thing is will change depending on the probabilities because you're doing probabilistic expectation on these random variables. Um, so these so options me, give me a certain. Yeah. Let me try to let me try to phrase why you think that O three should be wrote out in, in terms of e admissibility in this particular case. That is, if you looking at P1, suppose this is the probability that, that, that I endorse. In this situation, O1 is rated superior than O3. And if I look at P2, O2 is rated superior than O3. And if I look at P3 again, O2 is rated superior than O3. And for every P that's along the close interval between zero and one, I can find 
a o that is a function of that p that is preferable to o3 yes yes good whereas um, maximality says that for every p i can find a single o yeah um yeah which o, which thing o prime is the quantifiers are this order rather like and which o prime i pick can depend on the probability function whereas maximality says there exists an o prime such that for all p Prime Thank you very much. I, yeah. I'm sorry for, for dragging us on. No, no, this is no, it's very good. helpful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Good. So, um, bleh, there were some side thoughts that say, I think a quick thought is that I think we should think about the admissibility maybe as ruling things out, but actually I'm not sure that it's enough to give a positive judgment to something. Like if you say something's choice worthy, I think that's like a thumbs up. Yeah, go for it. That's okay. I'm not sure you get that from being not ruled out in this admissible way. Um, so maybe we could think about something being bad to choose if what we've been talking about when it's been ruled out in this e admissible way um but to be good to choose you've got to be certain or you've got to endorse its goodness for it to be good to choose you've got to think yeah i'm happy i'm positive i'm like every probability function or i endorse the set of probability functions that, that thumbs up this choice um so so a notion of being choice worthy that seems plausible is like you endorse its choice worthiness you endorse its goodness like you're confident that it's a good thing to choose um sometimes there'll be no good choice in this sense sometimes you just have mixed feelings like if you've got a set of probabilities this one thinks you have you have to do choice one this other thing thinks you have to do choice two there'll be nothing that's a good choice but yeah, that's okay you've got like mixed feelings um what your miscibility gets us is a bad choice yeah no you certainly shouldn't do that thing but i'm not sure i would like to call this other thing choice worthy um and i think jim joyce is saying some similar things um maybe it maybe it's not even enough to rule out the bad things because some things e of massable look bad to me if they're sort of weakly dominatedly bad like every probability function thinks this other thing is at least as good and some probability function thinks it's better feels like you shouldn't choose the original thing um but your admissibility will say yeah that's that's okay go for it um so maybe we should think about this a bit more but those are some side thoughts um since i'm talking about your admissibility and choice worthiness i was gonna quickly add them um i should really stop um but let me just kind of give give um some thoughts here so what i was going to say now is one reason people are talking about these choice functions um is seidenfeld um i think shervish and contain have um have thought about these choice functions using e admissibility as capturing the epistemic capturing kind of important differences between these non-convex sets of probabilities um and then that's kind of been taken on as a sort of model of belief um you might consider these choice functions as the model of belief um and you can consider them as a model of belief analogously to the way we consider desirable gambles as a model of belief um and the sort of things i was talking about on the desirable gamble side you can do here on the choice function side so we can look at which um which things which choice is be admissible but actually in this framework then in the way i thought about it we didn't look we're not going to look at e admissible choices but what we're going to think about is whether a set of gambles has some member of it which is desirable um and that's related to choice functions by um 
well, you rule it out if you think that this set of this set of um, this set of gambles has something that's to for e admissibility. You ruled it out if there's if you if you endorse that there's something else that's better. Um, that means endorsing that a set of this set of gambles has something that's strictly desirable. Um, it's not so. Don't need to understand the details here. The idea is that instead of looking at e-admissible choice choice worthiness, we're going to look at sets of gambles which have a strictly desirable member. That then looks like an extension of the desirable gambles framework, and some of that kind of um, work can be carried over. Um, we've got a representation then. If we have our model of belief, which sets are evaluated as having something that's strictly desirable. Notice the quantifiers are this way around rather than the other way. Like you just have to endorse that there is something. And then we get some axioms out, satisfies them. And then we have a result that says these are the right axioms. Um, and we note that these axioms are the ones that are independently being considered in the literature, though actually. The ones, though actually, there does seem to be a slight difference that this axiom wasn't included, but I. You know. The thing that they were trying to model is the thing we're getting out of the probability filters. Um, I think I will stop here. So let me go to my summary slide. So the idea is. We've got this probability filter model. You're capturing our beliefs by your endorsement of probabilistic properties. It's got to have these two features of being closed under supersets and finite intersections. It's kind of natural. I'm when I informally talk of things like this has positive expected utility, we can now capture that in our model. And when we talk about this set contains something that's desirable, we can capture in our model. Well, do you mean there is something that there is some member of the set such that you endorse that that thing is desirable? Or do you mean that the set contains something that's desirable? I just don't know which thing that and these are two different things and we can like clearly see the difference now. Um, so it's natural for talking about these things. It's very expressively powerful. It can capture well, sets of probabilities kind of very easily, but also this desirable gambles framework. Once we allow these non Archimedean kind of behavior that you have these sort of what would be hyper real probability um, uh, functions. So you think the probability is bigger than 0 0.5, but less than everything that's every any particular value bigger than 0 0.5. It also captures these mixing choice functions, um, sort of the e admissibility. Um, kind of axioms have come out. There's more to think about in terms of like how exactly to interpret this kind of endorsement. Maybe just I'll, um, there's some there's some relationships to work by Sarah Moss on probabilistic belief, probabilistic knowledge. Um, um, now I'm not sure she'll like everything I'm saying in here. In particular, this inconsistency thing she doesn't like, but there's some kind of connections to the framework that she's using going on. Um, there's more to think about interpreting, but it seems like a powerful and relatively natural framework. That's cool. Sorry, I've, I've talked longer than I wanted to. Um, um, thanks.